Welcome to NetLife with me, Dawn Staley. We've made it to the end of the season, and I appreciate, I so appreciate all of you for coming along for this ride. From starting out with my girl, Lisa Leslie, to having former President Bill Clinton, to today's guest, I can say that I have definitely fulfilled what net life is all about, the net sum of life. Wow. Well, th- this season was, was filled with, for me, I, I think is professional development. When you learn about what makes people tick, when you learn about how much of a leader they are and their style of leadership, I learned a lot. I took a lot of notes. Um, for the people that I knew somewhat, um, I ended up knowing a lot more about them uh, to share their stories, not only on a podcast, but in my everyday life. Because I do a lot of speaking engagements and I, I like to recycle good information. And I learned a lot of good information from being on this podcast. And I, I certainly um, look forward to, to sharing more and more and more. But until then, you should recycle and listen to all the podcasts that we have uh, we have banked. So I appreciate you. Love you. Last one. I'm not going to say it's the best one, but we, we're going to knock it out of the park. Adjustments between games. It was, it was contrasting styles. Um, uh, North Carolina is a pretty good basketball team. Young, super efficient. They know what they want. They're fast-paced. Um, they don't, you know, they work you, they work you, they work you, and they, you know, they, they find ways to be efficient whether that's driving hard at us to the basket, whether that's stopping and popping. We really had to really um, stay in tune with what people did uh, best. You know, you got um, Deja Kelly, who actually absolutely lit us up. And she lit us up doing the things that she normally does well. And we're not a team that usually gives someone as many looks of what they do best. But she did a great job of just... Um, forcing our hand. Um, so she had a really good game. And then we did a really good job of just kind of staying engaged with everyone else. Um, so everyone else really didn't get their average. Um, so it helped us in the end secure the win. And then we have to turn around and play a, a hot team like Creighton, who their style is five out, run you around, be patient enough until your defense makes a mistake, and then they make you pay for it. And they do it to a tune of, of 20 assists, which is unheard of. They lead the, they lead the country in assists. Um, and they take 33 pointers a game, making 10 of them. So we, had, we, we just tried to come up with a game plan that would limit the amount of threes they took, which were, which were like 21. That's nine less. So that's probably three or four less makes. They made, I believe, six of them or seven of them. Um, And then we tried to force them to put the ball on the floor and beat us at the basket. So we wanted them to two us rather than three us. Three and us would be what they do well. So I thought we did a really good job at at that and pressuring the basketball and making it more into a a one-on-one situation, which I think just favors us us when they have to shoot over our length. But all in all, really tough region in Greensboro. Um, Barrel. Um, the people there did an excellent job. You know, at the Greensboro Col- Coliseum, our hotel, it really felt special. And um, the NCAA did a tremendous job at giving our student athletes an incredible experience. It's, it's easy to be dialed in when you're, when you're playing in the third weekend of the NCAA tournament. We'll, we'll probably have to pull back just because of the excitement of um, being on the biggest stage of our, you know, of our of our sport. Um, we got probably half of our team that's that's never competed in a in a Final Four. To the other half, you know, it, it's a business trip for them. 
they they've gone to the final four and they've you know they experienced that that first time excitement now it's just making sure that you know our our season doesn't end or repeat itself from last season and that's um to not get to the national championship game and to not win a national championship so I think we got a good mix of of players who are going to enjoy it and players who will keep those players in line to know that it's a business trip. It's a hard thing to comprise, um, you know, what your season is worth. Like, you know, I'm, I'm one that we have a job to do, like a, a job to do. And our job is to win a national championship. One, because uh, we have the experience of, of playing in the Final Four, um, two, uh, we have a team that from top to bottom on the roster, uh, we have enough to win a national championship. We have national championship coaches um, who have been there before and who, you know, who will do a tremendous job at preparing us for um, who we'll face. Um, so I, I, I'll probably have to answer that question <laughs> after the season. But no, it won't be an unsuccessful season if we if we don't win. Um, but if we do win, again it's what we're supposed to do. But you know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna answer I'm gonna answer I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that question by saying our our path is divinely ordered. So whatever whatever becomes of uh, the final four weekend is what's supposed to happen. Um, the NCAA has has done enough for it to be the first year out from what we were what we came from, you know, um, unveiling what what took place um, and all the inequities that took place um, in last year's um, at NCAA tournament. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's a, a huge difference in. How how gyms feel like you know we 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 hosted the first and second round, um, we hosted the first four game first four, um, one of the first four games and um, <clears throat> it it felt like a neutral site like when we walked through the doors it was the same doors we walked through for probably twenty of our games this season, and it felt different you know we you know the security people had to check our bags we had to go through. You know, all the security protocols, you walk, you know, in the hallways, it had an NCAA feel to it. And, and yes, so it's good. And then we go to, to our regional um, in Greensboro, and we, it, it just felt different. The smell, you know, the new court, the new court smell um, was, was just inviting, just inviting. So... Um, yes, so we, we look forward to having a great Final Four, and we look forward to um, just improving our games on just aesthetics to more of, you know, some meat and potato things like, you know, like I, I spoke about this before, units. You know, men's basketball uh, programs that participate in the NCAA tournament, they, they're they providing units, and units are 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 – Money units are, you know, a, a, a form of what comes back to each school um, after all the money has been accumulated and and uh, and added up is is divvied amongst those those uh, those programs. I don't think that happens on the women's side, uh, but I also believe that um, in order for our game to grow, um, we have to. And it's nothing against the other women's sports, but we have to separate from other women's sports to see our our true worth. Because if we're if we're combined with the eighty eight other championships, all the Olympic sports, and it's nothing against them, it's nothing. I think we have enough money to. I'm mean, sorry, we have enough demand and value that. If women's basketball stands alone, we could probably fund some of those other championships, but we will never know that until we're able to separate that. And the way you do that is um, television. Television. 
We we need a, you know, we need a competitor to ESPN, in which I, you know, I love ESPN for what it's done for our women's game and, and all the other sports. But let's see. Let's see if we can stand on our own. Right now, we don't know. We don't know. So there's only speculation as to we lose money each championship. That's all, that's all that's, that has been said. Well, let's try something different to see if, you know, if our money can grow like the, the men's tournament because, you know, that's an investment. When you invest in it, I do believe you get a return on your investment 10, 20, 100-fold. Representation matters. I know is you know, is a cliche is saying nowadays um, to say representation matters, but when when you don't, when, when, when you're not a part of um, the biggest weekends in the NCAA tournament as a, as a black coach, um, everybody that's seeing that will only see who's represented, which, which, which are white coaches, male or female. And again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But our game is made up of so many, like, you know, black bodies that they need to be coached by other black bodies. Now, I'm not saying all, like, you know, like, you know, I'm, I'm the only black coach that's going to be represented at the, at the Final Four. I'm happy, you know, I'm happy about that. Um, Neil Ivy had a, an opportunity to be, you know, to advance. Um, it, it didn't happen, you know, by the luck of the draw because I thought they played well enough. And then the margin of error starts to shrink. And then when they were put in that situation, um, much like us last year, uh, we didn't deliver. So we miss out on another historical moment. Um, but she'll be back. And just like those other, uh, the, the, the 12 other or 11 other black women coaches who were part of the NCAA tournament, it feels good. It feels good to, to know that we make up you know, almost, you know, almost 25% of the tournament. And then, then there are these jobs, these power five jobs that are opening up and are being secured by um, some black coaches. You know, Virginia just hired another black coach. Um, Arizona State just hired another black coach. It, it, is, it is our time now. It is the movement of female black coaches, which... I'm, I'm super proud of, um, you know, but we, we, we still got work to do. And I, I got to shout out, you know, our brothers out there who, who aren't getting opportunities. Black men don't get opportunities, um, zero, like zero opportunities to run any program. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to shout them out and ask if, if they can get the opportunity to lead, to be in lead positions, because I know we say, you know, I know we're we're all for uh, pushing forward black women, but we can't, you know, our, our our black men have been in our game for a long time as assistant coaches that need an opportunity um, to run their own programs because, you know, they shouldn't be pigeonholed into just being assistant coaches when um, they're qualified to take the next step. What I've tried to emulate um, in all the teams that I've coached is what I've gotten as a player from being on USA basketball teams. Um, when you're on a USA basketball team, you have you have one goal. It's, it's gold or failure. So when you're when you're put under the gun like that, you immediately think about um, your sister that you're lining, you know, up next to. And you want to do it for them, and you want to do it for us, and you want to do it for the team because um, there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of people out there that that, that don't like Americans for one reason or another. Um, um, but let, make no mistake, we work hard. Like, we work hard. Everything that we've, we've won, we've earned because we've worked hard um, for it. And we did it in a way that, that the culture of, of USA basketball is, is so incredibly pure. Like, it's, it's like we don't care about who scores what. We don't we don't look at the stat sheet. We we just worry about one thing is is beating our opponent and making sure that 
we secure gold medal after gold medal after gold medal. And I just find that that, that was synonymous with success. So I try to I try to emulate that by being real with our players, even, you know, even when it, it hurts them. I think we have to we have to as coaches make our players uncomfortable because when they're uncomfortable, growth is taking place. If they're always feeling like, you know, like like you you, you, you know, my mother my mother didn't mind hurting her kids. I mean, she didn't she didn't go out try to go out of her way to hurt us, you know, but she was very strict. If she said be in the house at six o'clock, then you probably need to be there five fifty. If she said, you know, don't bring bad grades home from school, you know, she ain't really help us with our homework, but we better find a way to bring good grades home or else she's going to take these things away from us. So she instilled a discipline in us that, that we can't fail. We can't fail. So she, we, we have to find a way. So for me, I take it, I, I just take it personally to know each and every one of our, our players. And I know, you know, I mean, you know, Asia Wilson and, and, and my relationship is, is pretty, is pretty strong. I don't have a strong relationship with all of my players because that's not what they want. If you want a strong relationship with me, it's a, it's a two way street. You know, I'm going to do my part. You know, I am going to do my part. Um, and sometimes in doing my part, I could come off as, I probably can come off as mean. I could probably come off as, um, uncaring because I think nowadays young people equate caring with, giving them what they want instead of giving them what they need. So I'm going to give them what they need in order for them to be successful. And they can hate me in the process, but I know, and it may not happen within the four or five years that they're with us at, at South Carolina, but I know they always come back. They always come back and say, uh, and, and talk about the life lesson that they learned through playing on, on our teams, and that's most important to me, is not to be liked, because, you know, liking is at your fingertips. Liking, you can like something on Twitter, you can like something on, you know, on social media, so they want that instant like. I don't really need that in order for me to do my job, and my job is to make sure uh, they're, they're as successful or prepare for success as they need to be. What, what I want selfishly is to be a Naismith Hall of Famer as a coach. Um, but I do feel like being a Naismith Coach of the Year um, puts me one step closer to becoming that. Um, but, you know, awards don't really move me. What moves me is awards for my players. Um, Aaliyah Boston is up for it, for the, the player of the year and the defensive player of the year. Like, I would give, I would give, you know, me being a nominee for coach of the year for actually someone else to be uh, rewarded with, with that. Uh, I think Aaliyah Boston has secured her national player of the year awards um, and the defensive player of the year. So I think there's somebody on our team that's deserving of some recognition. You know, I've always talked about Bree Bill. I've always talked about Victoria Saxton. I'm going to now talk about um, we got a great team that um, when we go on the road, um, they have to be our scout team. So they have to be, you know, our, our highlighters. We got, a, we got a, a male practice squad that we call the highlighters who absolutely take care of business when we're at home and we're practicing in the confines of our facilities. But then when we go on the road, we got our great team who has to take their place and, and, and be the other team. Um, they were Creighton, they were UNC, um, and, 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 and they were Miami, um, and they were Howard. They don't get recognition. They don't get off the bench a whole lot. Um, but they prepare us um, 
like no other. And we get on them to stay in character with, with being um, either Howard, Miami, UNC, or Creighton. Um, and they do such a great job, such a, a, a selfless job of preparing us. So if, if, if I'm able to, to, to get this award, I would love to share it with them because they're often the unsung heroes of our, of our team. Considering that I've, I've been nonstop for, I mean, we went from um, last season to, to I think I, I coached the America Cup team um, so we had training camp, we had, actually we had trials, then we had training camp, and then we went on to, uh, Puerto Rico to play in the America. From there, I, I had very little time, um, because we went right from there to, to Tokyo with the Olympic team, and then when I got back from Tokyo, which was August, we, we were getting ready for our season, so our, our preseason, so I haven't, I haven't taken much time off, but surely I'm going to take some time off. Probably I, I'm supposed to take a trip to uh, um, the Panama Canal shortly after the Final Four. So win, lose, or draw, I'm, I'm probably going to do that and then come back and get back into the swing of things because, you know, to, to win a national championship – uh, or, or lose a national championship and be on the quest and that journey to be to be national champions, it starts well before the season. So it starts in the in the in the off season, um, and then it starts in the preseason. And we have to we have to set that up. So I'll take some time off, uh, but I I enjoy what I do uh, because being a dream merchant, um, you can't take too many days off. Because the more days you take off, the no, the more days your your players that you that you coach up want to take days off. They want to see you, they want to see you work just as much as they work. I know you can't wait to hear my interview with AI. I was super excited that we were able to secure AI uh, to be on the podcast because. You know, he doesn't do a whole lot of interviews. He doesn't do a whole lot of podcasts. Um, he's just that kind of dude where he's comfortable in his skin. He only does things that he wants to do. And we were fortunate enough to get him to come on the podcast. And I, I learned so much about him. I know um, he he represents, still represents. He represented the culture back then when he played to this day. Everyone loves AI um, for the very reasons that I love him. One, he's just super positive, super positive. He, he only knows one way, and that's his way, and he's comfortable in his skin. He's unapologetic. Um, he's a family man. He loves his kids. He loves his girl. He always says his girl, um, and he loves people. He loves people. He loves people even if they don't love him back. Um, so special person that I enjoy spending um, about an hour with, and I'm super grateful that he took the time to join NetLife. Before we get to that interview, though, I have a special message from one of NetLife's partners. Throughout this season of NetLife, we've been sharing with you a podcast we love called Flame Bearers. Flame Bearers just launched a very powerful special edition episode last week, which in light of the Russian war on Ukraine, is a bit different than their normal episodes. In an effort to elevate Ukrainian voices and the connection between sports and politics, they speak with three elite Ukrainian athletes, Valentina Mochonyets, Vita Oleksik, and Olena Kavitska. Here's a short clip from their special edition episode. When it comes to sport, Russia and Ukraine have historically managed to keep the focus on sport, not politics. But that's just no longer the case. 
стали відноситись до нас як і їхній президент. Everyone has long been aware of the conflicts between us, but we had never tried to drag sports into this and have always tried to have positive relationships with the Russian athletes. But now, not all, but many of the Russian athletes have started to treat us just like their president does. Ukrainian athletes have been experiencing very serious hostility from certain Russian athletes. And this is due to the fact that what Ukraine and most of the world is hearing compared to Russians are hearing are two completely different stories. This episode of Flame Bears highlights the realities of the war in Ukraine and the message they want the world to hear. Listen to more Flame Bears wherever you get your podcast. The Beijing Paralympics are finally here. While you watch as athletes compete, hear their stories. Listen to top women athletes share their trials and triumphs on the Flame Bears podcast. Stay tuned for more and what's ahead on Flame Bears season two. What's the best workout program? The one that is custom built just for you. Future is the new workout experience that pairs you one-on-one with your own fitness coach. Your coach will map out a plan based on your goals with workouts delivered to your phone each week. Future, your Apple Watch and the app all pair seamlessly so you and your coach can track your progress, celebrate achievements, and keep you accountable every day. Get started right now with 50% off your first three months at tryfuture.com slash netlife. Allen Iverson is one of the greatest and most influential basketball players to ever hit the court. Recently named one of the NBA's top 75 players of all time. Allen Iverson was a was the number one pick, draft pick, 11-time All-Star, and the league's MVP in 2001. Unapologetically himself, AI's fashion, attitude, bold persona forever changed the culture of basketball. AI, welcome to the show. Um, well, I'm from, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh huh. I'm from Philly, and I played college in Virginia. You're from Virginia, and you became right. a Philadelphia legend playing for the Sixers. Um, I was actually wrapping up my college career at UVA while you were making headlines as the best high school football and basketball player in the state. Um, I, I, I did actually hear a lot about you. And I actually heard more about you as a football player than a basketball player. Right. Um, I would watch the news and I would see them um, showing highlights of you just blazing on the on the field and doing what you're doing. Um, and I just I, I marveled like, you know, they they told me they told me you were short. I know they I know they had you down to six one. Come yeah. on now. Come on now. Give it to us. Yeah. How, how, how tall are you? I'm six feet legit. See, six feet legit. Yeah, hey, well, you, you you made up a lot um, in your heart and 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 the way you played. Um, right. When I you know when I when I when I think of you, and I think about what you meant to Philadelphia, and I know you know the love that that we all show you um, every time that you every time that you come to a game. Um, but but you were it for us. Like you were it for the young kids that were growing up in Philly that, you know, we only had the Sixers. We only had the Eagles. We only had the Phillies. We, on, we only had sports to really push us through. But when you came, we we identify with you. I think I think your your power as a Philadelphia 76er helped. A lot of young kids that that grew up in the projects like I did, um, you helped us through. You gave us somebody to say, "I mean, if this, if he can do it, I can do it too." I so, it. What, what do you think about your power as as someone who 
I mean, you lifted communities. I know you lifted a lot of communities in Philadelphia. So, so what do you think about your your power as a you know as a Philadelphian? Because we we we've adopted you. It's it's um. Hold on, before we before we get into that, um, um, one of the things you said um, and you mentioned was the fashion part and what I did for fashion. And it's ironic that you brought that up because right before we was going on, my youngest daughter got on my hat. So I had to change my hat because I was kind of paranoid that she might be right. So I changed my hat. <laughs> so I'm, um, I'm, I'm still, you know, um, taking advice from the young, especially my baby, because she care about my parents. But um, it's only one word. It's, it's a blessing. You know what I mean? Simple as simple as that to be able to um, to um, have an impact on the culture the way I did um, and the way I still do. Um, it's just simply a, a blessing is, I guess God wanted me in that position. And, um, I felt that, you know, he, he feel obviously that I was able to handle it because I kind of took the ass whipping for it in the beginning, especially the way I dressed, um, the way I, um, I looked, um, and, um, now it's just beautiful to see all of the guys be able to, and, and women be able to express themselves the way they want to today. And, um, you know, it feel good that, you know, even though I had to take an ass whooping for it, you know, it, 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 it paid off, you know what I mean? Because it helped so many other, other people. And, um, you know, everybody talked about, you know, the cornrows and I got, you know, it was called the thug for the tattoos and all that. I would have had more tattoos at Georgetown, but I just couldn't afford them. Um, <laughs> the cornrows, uh, they were just, um, I was tired of people messing my hair up on the road. So I was like, man, if I just get cornrows, I don't have to worry about that. You know what I mean? So, you know, that was the thought into that. And then, you know, the way I dress, I was just dressing like guys that I grew up with. You know what I mean? And, um, and that was the whole thing. I was just um, unapologetic, you know, to everything. And it just wanting to be me and being comfortable in my own skin. And I think everybody should be that way, you know what I mean? Because, you know, it's it's only one you, you know what I mean? Everybody else is taking up, you know what I mean? What's wrong with being you? And um, that was just the message that I was trying to send. Cool. Uh, hey, do you remember when we first met? No. Okay, me either. No. But I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you the, I'm gonna give you when we didn't All even know, meet. I don't remember, I don't remember when it was. All I remember was, um, just being so nervous because, um, you were like, first of all, you were always on my TV being from Virginia and you played for Virginia. You know what I mean? That's how, you know, ultimately you became my favorite, you know, women's basketball player of all time. So, you know, I used to always see you and couldn't believe like you were the first one that I couldn't believe a woman could actually, you know, play that way. So um, I just remember the first time um, I met you just trying to, I don't remember the exact date, but just trying to be, trying not to look too um, excited, trying to keep my cool. Like I was the first time I, you know, met Mike, like, you know, not on the court, but off the court, just trying to keep my composure, just keep it together. So I just remember that meeting you. All right. You know, I, I remember, uh, the Sixers used to work out at St. Joe's. So I used to work at St. Joe's before y'all would get to practice. And then I would just stay. I would stay and just watch practice. And then sometimes John Lucas would, would allow me to come into practice and, you know, do some drills. Um, but I, I, I used to just watch you like, <laughs> like, <laughs> and it was, it was sometimes it was before the game. I can remember when y'all were about to play the Lakers, like, Half of your hair was done and half yeah. of your hair was braided, right? So yeah. I knew you were going to get your hair done in between the game, um, between shoot-around and then the game. I used to be taking it out <laughs> doing, doing shoot-around, like when we stopped play. Yeah, you're exactly you, right. And you used to, used, to, used to imitate Kobe, like, during practice. Like, you would be like, I, I remember you saying, Kobe Jordan. <laughs> 
<laughs> I remember yeah. you saying that dur- during practice. So, I mean, it's, a, it's amazing to see just, you know, just seeing you behind closed doors and then actually coming down to the Sixers games and, and, and seeing you, and seeing you, you ball out. Like I, it, it was, your career was incredibly amazing. Like you made because of your height and because of your toughness and because you made the game look really easy, you made us really feel like we could do some of the things that you did. And and again, we were we were living through watching you play. Um, but you you know you had fame at a, at a very young age, right. um, and you were considered iconic at a very young age. At what point in high school did you realize that you were you were more than an athlete? That you were an icon in your community, someone that a lot of people just looked up to you, and you know, and it's a, a lot of people scrutinized. As well, um, I was I was having a conversation with my my girl, um, the other night, and I was telling her like, since I was eight years old, um, I always stood out as an athlete. You know what I mean? All the older guys, you know, used to always you know say you know they go Chuck, they go the one, he's the one. You know what I mean? Every time I come in um, a gym or anything like that, it always been like that. So I was basically used to it by the time I got to high school and college and even, even in the pros. And, um, I basically always just looked at it like, just be yourself. You know what I mean? Um, and I didn't, I didn't want to act other than, you know, who I am, like on, on the basketball court, I'm, I'm totally different, um, off the court. You know what I mean? I, I like to laugh and act up with my family and my friends and um, you know, just do stuff that that regular people do. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know why it's like that with me. You know what I mean? I see other athletes and people. I be with them and people are scared to approach them. But with me, you know, it's totally different. And I always wanted, you know, to have that persona to where it's, you know I was approachable and I wanted people to basically um look at me like anybody else. You know what I mean? Because I am. I'm. I'm Everybody else, you know what I mean? I'm just on the stage. I'm just a, you know, a, a good basketball player, but you know what I mean? Off the court, I'm just a regular dude. So you you just brought up Chuck, your 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 your, your people in your your neighborhood called you Bubba Chuck. Where, where did that nickname come from? <laughs> it's crazy and it's real. Um I had an uncle named Bubba. And one named Chuck, and they were arguing over my nickname, and my mom just said, "Name him Bubba Chuck." <laughs> that's, that's, that's funny how that how that Very sticks. Simple. Very now, simple. Now, now, if anybody calls you Bubba Chuck, that that means they they really know you, like they know me. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I I'll be in the arena, I'll be anywhere. You know what I mean? I could be. Um, I remember times I was in China, and somebody was like Chuck. You know what I mean? I turned and looked. I thought it was somebody from home. Or whatever, but that's just you know some fans find out your nickname and you know they want to have that attachment with you and then they just start calling you that you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, like I'm I'm Chuck to everybody. It's so crazy that um I was at All Star this this year and um well in, in February obviously and you know the younger guys call me Chuck. You know what I mean. I'm thinking you know it always usually be AI AI. But now it's, it's transitioned to to Chuck. You know what I mean? I, I guess because you know I'm more visible than I used to used to be. You know what I mean? When I was playing, um, and you know now guys just you know get comfortable and they call me Chuck. That's, that's pretty good. Um, a few years ago, they renamed your, your high school gym after you. Can you talk about right. what that moment meant? to you in light of the crazy highs and lows of your high school career? Yeah, you did. You, t- you did tell me um, about, you did ask me about the scrutiny and all that. I just thought that that came with the territory. You know what I mean? You know, Some people love you, some people don't. You know what I mean? And it's, it's always been like that throughout my life. You know, I always figured, you know, if a million people love you and a million people hate you, you concentrate on the ones that love you. And why would you concentrate on the ones that hate you because they hate you. So why would you even give them, you know, that energy? 
And that that um that gym was just like, and then just having the people there that I love, like my family and the people that I grew up with, and you know, coaches and all of the people that supported me, you know, throughout this journey to have those people there, it was it was so special. And then to call my gym, you know, the Allen Iverson Gymnasium, it was just Oh man, it was a surreal moment. It was um, it was hard to hold back tears. I I shared some, um, but just being there with with my girl and my kids, it was just epic. It was something that I'll remember and I cherish for the rest of my life. Um, and it's something that you know the people from around my way, from everything that I've been through, can be taken away. You know what I mean? It's it's written. Yeah, that was earned. That was earned. So yeah, when you look definitely. back. When you look back at your NBA career, do you think you were you were ahead of your time in terms of just being just you, unapologetically you? I think I think I was I was different because it was something that they they never had seen before. You know what I mean? And it's always it's always like that. You know what I mean? I could think about you know my um, I could think about you know Michael Jordan. You know what I mean? I think about um, Michael Jackson. You know what I mean? Like, well, Michael Jackson was just something that we couldn't believe. Like, we, we just couldn't believe somebody could be that talented and so different from everybody else. You know what I mean? Just having the whole package. And then with me, um, it was just different because it was something that you never seen before. You know, you were so used to guys just looking a certain way. Everybody looked the same. You know what I mean? Guys didn't play the same. You know what I mean? So why should everybody have that same image? Why should everybody have that same persona, that same personality, and everybody trying to be like somebody before them? Yeah, obviously, the guys that paved the way for me, I owe them all the honor and the respect, all the glory, because, you know, they gave me the vision to be what I wanted to be as a basketball player. But as a person, I wanted to be and remain me. You know what I mean? I wanted um, for me to look in the mirror and Tawana always been able to look at me and say I'm the same person and my mom and my family and my friends, you know what I mean? Um, I wanted them to know that, you know, the the fame and the fortune wasn't going to change me and turn me to somebody else. And somebody wasn't going to put a battery in my back and drive me off a cliff. You know what I mean? If, if I was going to do that, I was going to do it on my own. So, um, I mean, it, it meant everything to me for just, you know, just be, being myself and, you know, with the clothes and, you know, with them having to end up changing the dress code and all of that stuff, you know what I mean? I thought that was a, that was basically, um, I didn't look at it as um, somebody knocking me down. You know, I, 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 I was excited about it, you know what I mean? Cause I knew that I was staying true to who I was and, you know, being comfortable. I always thought like, why would I wear a suit to a game? You know what I mean? I ain't never wearing no suit to the playground to play pickup basketball. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and after the after the game, I was, you know, going to the club. So I would wear <laughs> what I would wear to the club. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, but okay. but now look at it now. Like by by them doing that to me, and me having to go through that. Now look at guys now. You see guys have on whatever they want to wear to the game. It's like a fashion show, mm-hmm. and I you know like to feel like I had a lot to do with that. I mean, I, I I don't want to get too personal, but when you started having kids, what did that do to you? Did you did you did you look at life differently? Um, and as as they grew up, um, as AI is their dad, um, mm-hmm. how were they? You know, that what did they like to dress like you? Were there who who was the most like you? Um, you know, and, and your your kid as your kids, who who was the most like you? Um, I would say my, um, my oldest son, um, I would say my oldest son, the guy that used to be sitting on my lap at, um, at the podium, um, and I, um, my youngest daughter, my last child, I would say probably, um, resemble me the most. And you can see a lot of the similarities in them, you know what I mean? But, um, the other three, uh, wonderful. You know what I mean? Um, I'm proud of them all. You know what I mean? They got their ups and downs. They make their mistakes. Um, I never wanted to put the pressure of who I am on them. I never 
pressured them into playing basketball or anything like that. Like if that's what they wanted to do, I was going to support it and whatever else they want to do in life, I'm with it. And I always thought that I wanted them to be proud of who I am. You know what I mean? And um, a lot of times um, I got to the point where um, I was overdoing it, you know, because they were, they got used to knowing that, okay, Allen Iverson, that's their celebrity dad. So when st certain stuff come on TV and, you know what I mean? Like my new shoes come out and all that, you know, they want other shoes. They want to wear <laughs> other stuff. You know what I mean? No, you just daddy. You know what I mean? All right, daddy, we're not seeing you on TV. We don't need to see this old game that's on um, the NBA classics and all that. You know what I mean? <laughs> they come there. Okay, daddy, you playing and they keep going. And, and, and I think that's cool. You know what I mean? Just me being daddy. They look at me as daddy. You know what I mean? And that's the way I want um, all of the people that's close to me and knew me before the, you know, Allen Iverson run, you know what I mean? Like, I want you to stay true to me like it was, you know, before that, you know, don't look at me as Allen Iverson. I want you to look at me as Chuck and the rest of the world can have AI. Mm -hmm. how, how conscious were you of both all the young kids that looked up to you and all the adults who thought you were just a bad role model? All, all, all that, um, I never, I never heard that. I never heard a bad role model. I never heard that um, stigma put it on me. Um, and I definitely never heard it from kids. You know what I mean? And I was always in awe of the fact that, you know, kids, the way they related to me, the way they, um, you know, the way they looked up to me, the way they wanted to be like me, the way they acted around me, you know what I mean? Um, and, and even with any, you know, negative things that I went through throughout my career, I, I kind of use, you know, the people that love me as a crutch and understood um, that I was going to make mistakes. And, um, you know, my whole thing was just trying not to make the same mistake twice. Um, I understood that um, everybody's not going to love you. You know what I mean? Every article is not going to be written good. You know, I, it took me a while to understand that because I used to think the media people, um, the beat writers and stuff um, in Philadelphia, I always thought that, you know, just because we laugh and joke, you know, in the locker room and, you know, all of that stuff and how you doing and this, that, and the third, I used to think they were my friends. You know what I mean? But they had a job to do. I, I didn't realize it until I got older, until I started to understand the way the whole thing went. You know what I mean? When I came in, I was like a rebel, you know what I mean? Because I was something that they never seen before. Yeah, I look like a thug, but ain't nothing tough about me, but on the basketball court or when I'm protecting my girl and my kids. You know what I mean? That's the only, that's one of my toughness come out. But other than that, you know what I mean? The things that they were saying about me, like being a tough street guy and all that, that ain't me. I'm tough on the court. You know what I mean? So I had to, I had to juggle, you know, my relationship with the media, you know, because whether you like it or not, you know what I mean? Somebody would rather talk about um, Osama, Osama bin Laden before they talk about somebody saving a cat from a tree. You know what I mean? The negative yeah. story is always going to be the best story. And then I, I looked at it like, you know, those people had a job to do, you know what I mean? And when there was some controversy, you know, going on with me and a coach or me and, you know, trade rumors or whatever, they had to do their job. You know what I mean? I had to understand that, that those were my friends. You know what I mean? I was fortunate enough to come in the league with friends. So, you know, I had no business trying to feel like I was in it to make some more. So what do you think was the biggest misconception that people had about you as an athlete? Um, that you was thug, yeah. That, uh, that you that, that was was it the thug thing? Yeah, I think I think that came from I think that came from uh, my appearance, but um, um, I've never been cocky. I've never been arrogant. Um, I've never been conceited, unless I be I get to talking about my looks. You know what I mean? Or whatever. So <laughs> that's that's probably it. You know what I mean? But um, um I'm just confident, you know what I mean? And 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 I it, it it comes off as cockiness because it always is I was always taught 
if it's me against you, it's me. You know what I mean? And that's not that's not arrogance. That's that's being confident. You know what I mean? And that separates a lot of players, which people, you know, the people that's the greats, they understand. You know what I mean? You don't want to be average. I want to be looked at, you know what I mean, as one of the greats. If I'm on the court with Black Jesus, you know what I mean? Everybody know who he is, but after this is over, you're going to know who number three is. Like You're going to know who the answer is. You know what I'm saying? And I always, you know, I, I never came into a game. I'm always nervous. I'm nervous in a pickup game. I'm nervous in a charity game. I'm nervous at practice before we start playing. But when the ball go up and it all just, it, it, it fades away. You know what I mean? I've, you know, I, I've, I've, I've learned so much in the game as far as the eyes, like, of my opponents, like, especially the guy, that's, the guy that's guard me. You know, I've always done before the, before the game, before the tip-off, when you dap everybody up, I would look at the guy that's going to guard me. I would look him in his eyes, and he would look at me. And as soon as I see him look away, I'm like, oh, I got his ass. You know what I mean? And it's hard, it's, it's hard to guard me when you, you know, you're not afraid, but you don't got a chance when you're scared. Uh-huh. Um, but that was, that was, that was basically it. Just, just my appearance or whatever. Like if you ask any teammate of mine, you know what I mean? That I've ever had. And that's as far as all stars and, you know, being traded and whatever. I got along with all of my teammates. I got a great relationship with them still today. I actually, um, uh... And I'm moving around a little bit. Um, it's all good. Lou, Lou Will, he, he, I actually um, heard a story about how you, how you gave him like all types of jewelry. It was a bag that had, I don't know what it was, had money. Did it have money in it? And your jewelry, you wanted your jewelry back though, right? You didn't really care about yeah. the money. What, what was that was, story? Because Lou was like, um, he was my little man. Like, um, he was, he was, he was, uh, I was his favorite player growing up. And, you know, I guess God wanted it to go that way in his life. Like, you gonna come into the league and you're honestly, like me coming into the league and I'm playing for the Bulls. And Michael Jordan is obviously my hero. He's he's my guy, he's my everything. You know, he gave me the vision. He made me want to play basketball. Like I actually, you know, that commercial want to be like Mike, like I actually, wanted to be like Mike, you know what I mean? So it was the same thing with Lou, you know what I mean? And um, I just gravitated to him. I, I mean, just loved everything about him, you know what I mean, even today. And um, and he was my little man. And um, I think I told him to hold my bag or whatever. And then when I got my bag back, um, I told him basically to keep the money that was in the bag. And he was like, all of it? And I was like, yeah, you know what I mean? Because he was, you know, when you come in, Everybody think when you're a rookie that everything is peaches and cream. You're rich and you're famous and all that, but it's, it's, it's not like that. You know what I mean? So it was times I had to, you know, I had to look out for him or whatever. And that was just my, my way of um, not being a, a big shot or nothing, but just looking out for my little man. That's all. You know what I mean? It, it probably meant something to him. You know what I mean? Um, Today or even back then, it probably he was probably shocked about something like that. But um, I think I did a lot more to him um, besides giving him the money that was in that bag because I put a lot up here for him and gave him a lot of confidence and a lot of wisdom um, about what goes on in his league and the confidence um, for him to be um, someone that's definitely going to be in the Hall of Fame one day. Talk about the brotherhood that's in – like the NBA, like when you, when you were, when you were a player and then we're going to move, you, then we're going to move to what you think about some of the things that are happening like now. But, but when you were a player, you know, mm-hmm. you just mentioned about Lou Will and the friendship that you all developed. Um, who was, who, who took you under their wing and kind of showed you the way? Um, first, um, Derek Coleman. Derek Coleman was it for me. Like I was, uh, I was, man, I would be up under him, like, you know, just like a little brother, you know, everything that he did, I, I mean, I would do, like, I remember um, he bought um, a Rolls Royce, 
And I saw that car. I was maybe 21 years old. I never seen anything like that. And I was like, man, what kind of car is that? And he was like, this is not a car. This is an automobile. You know what I mean? And he was like, <laughs> and he was like, and don't ride a whole bunch of dudes in this car right here. Like he was a, you know, I, I, and this is a true story. He was like, the only person that ride in this car is Tawana. You know what I mean? And he was like, nobody's supposed to ride in this car but her or you by yourself. And one night, you know, all of us was out in the club and everybody was drinking and whatever. And my man was in the car. And he made the guy get out of the car. You know what I mean? Like, you know, come here, let me talk to you. And then the guy got out of the car and was talking to him. He walked over the car and he said, pull off, you know, me and your man getting ready to go somewhere else. But in actuality, he was just getting the guy out of the car. You know what I mean? And he had nowhere to take my homeboy, but he was just my guy. I started, I never knew anything about Chris Dial. You know what I mean? I started drinking Cristal because he was drinking Cristal. Like, and he was telling me, like, summertime AI, you know, when you're riding around Philly, man, you, you take the top down and then you put on your gold, I mean, your uh, diamond chain and you don't wear no, uh, you don't wear no shorts. I mean, no um, shirt, just a pair of Versace boxes and some slippers. And I used to actually do it. <laughs> and no, you can't get out the car like that. But I was just riding around, you know, just trying to do everything that he did. I remember a coach one time telling me it was Johnny Davis. And he was like, and whenever DC didn't practice, I didn't practice. And DC was a vet, so he never practiced. So I used to, man, I used to be sitting on the sideline. He was like, I'm just, I said, well, what, what are you going to do? You going to practice? No, I'm just going to sit over here and look at y'all and get some laughs. You know what I mean? I used to go sit right beside him and be like, I'm not practicing today. And he came up, Johnny Davis was like, no, you can't do what DC do. He had coach's nightmare. You know what I mean? But DC was the guy for me before it turned into Aaron McKee and Eric Snow. Aaron McKee is the best friend, you know, that I've ever had in the NBA. Like Aaron McKee was everything to me. You know what I mean? Off the court, he was just, I would listen to him with any, anything. Off the court, on the court, he was just a big brother that I never had. I never could imagine being in a teammate and, and being a teammate with a guy from two, we were from two different worlds, not, you know, from where we come from, but he was from Philadelphia. I was from Virginia. We came from the same upbringing, but I mean, this guy was just so much to me. I love him. I mean, still today, we, we, we still keep up. Um, that's my man, you know what I mean? To the grave and Eric Snow, those guys were, were like everything to me. I remember coach Thompson, I mean, oh, coach Thompson. Mm. <laughs> but um, Coach Brown, um, he used to tell Eric, you know, Eric, tell him this, tell him that, whatever. And he used to be like, man, you tell him, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I would, he knew that I would receive it a lot better mm. you know, from, from Eric. But, but those were my guys. Yeah. So how true is it, you know, because we got the news in Philly. Did your Rolls Royce ever run out of gas? Like, was that, did I hear a story about your, your, one of your cars. I'm, I'm, that, that's happened recently. Like, <laughs> I, I don't have, I've had my Bentley run out of gas before. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I just, you know, just be, I, I just don't pay attention sometimes. <laughs> oh, I get in it thinking I can make it. You know what I mean? And I was taking my, my daughter. Um, and that's crazy. You saying that I was taking my daughter's, when was that dream? No, that was Messiah. It was dream. When was that? When was it? Huh? Like what, six months? <laughs> like three or four months. We was almost there. And I was like, we gonna make it, whatever. Cause I knew I needed gas. I knew I needed gas the night before, but I made it home. So I was like, I'm gonna get some tomorrow before we um before I take Dream to school. But we were running late. So I was like, I just try my luck again. And we got to a light, man. And I'm walking down the street. We almost there. I'm walking down the street, and some guy from um some guy from from Africa was riding by. He was like Allen Iverson. He was from Africa. <laughs> he was like he was like Allen Iverson. And I, you know, I'm looking at him. I'm like, man, I got to get her to school. She about to be late. And he turned around, and we got in his car and took Dream to school. And then he took me. Got to, um took me to Pet Boys. Got a can um with gas. And, 
filled me up. I came back, the cops was there and you know what I mean? They were nice. He helped us, um, you know, get everything together and the rest was history. But yeah, it's happened. <laughs> it's happened since then. <laughs> so that's, that was probably true. <laughs> so um, at, as such a, a talented and influential player, you've kind of had to transition to a role as a caretaker of the game. Mm -hmm. You recently made waves by shouting out Ja Morant on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, do you think he's the guy that that is very similar to how you play? I, I see him, I see a lot of him in me, but a lot of, I can see it in a lot of players. You know what I mean? I can, I can see it in a lot of players. And I think, um, I think what's dope is it's not a limit of, of size when it, when it comes to people taking from my game, you know what I mean? Because you can see it with even big guys, you see big guys with handles now, you know what I mean? And crossing people over and stuff like that. Um, but it's the same thing with me. Like I wanted to be fast, like Isaiah, I wanted to shoot like Bird and Reggie. I wanted to rebound like Barkley, dominant like Shaq. You know what I mean? Um, I wanted to do everything like Mike. You know what I mean? I took pieces from everybody. You know what I mean? And you can see guys implement, implementing, I'm sorry, um, different skill sets from, from everybody games before them. You know what I mean? You can see it. And, and the league's always going to be in good hands because it's going to always get better. And I'm such a I'm such a big fan of basketball. It's easy to love these younger guys. You know what I mean? Like, um, I think I hit some rough passage with relationships early in my career with the older guys because they were just as stunned as the rest of the world of the way I came in and and um, you know, who I was, Don, like, you know, I always, when I played in college, I always had to deal with uh, boxing ones. I had to deal with what is one, three ones, um, two threes, and all these gimmick defenses. And my whole mentality was when I get into the league, they can't, they got to play man to man. And who can guard me man to man? No one. And then Four scoring titles later, all of a sudden, <laughs> they got zones back in the game. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So y'all changed and put zones back in the game. Somebody six feet tall. You know what I mean? Um, but, yeah, you know, when I look at John, I look at Steph, and I look at Kyrie and KD and LeBron, and you just honest and all these, you know, Luca from – you know, from where he from, I mean, if if the only way that you can tell he from somewhere else is because you know he's from somewhere else. You know, he looked like when <laughs> Luca is bad. You know what I'm saying? Like his game is just like one of ours. You know what I mean? And it's just the, the future of it is just gonna be so much better. And I, I I never wanted, I want the young guys to be comfortable with me. I want them to know that. I'm in their corner. I like, you know, shouting them out. I like giving them their just dues when they deserve it. You know what I mean? Because they do, you know, and I deserved it back then. And I got it towards the end of my career. It was tough in the beginning, but I never wanted to be, be like that. Like my favorite player is Steph. You know what I mean? I, I love Steph. I mean, must see TV. You know, I get my popcorn and, you know, I got my lead pass and I'm, you know, I'm waiting on to go to state game. You know what I mean? Along with a, a lot of the other guys, but you know, I just I just respect them, you know what I mean? And I I, I respect them like the respect that I wanted when I played. Yeah. So you know, you know, a lot of retired guys don't really feel as like you do. Right. You know, there's there, there's some that just speak out um not not so much in a positive fashion when it comes <laughs> to um the young players that are in the game today for, for whatever reason. I don't know if it's the, the, the money that's in the game now. I don't know. Yeah, but we had to deal, we had to deal with it, Don, because because yeah. we were getting paid way more than the guys before us. And it's the guys that's getting all this money now, I mean, 10 years, 20 years down the line, it's gonna be more than they were making. You know, it's gonna just keep getting better. That's how great the game is. You know what I mean? But 
I I can't understand why I, I don't I can't speak for those guys and I I don't know who they are. I don't know who you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But I I I don't I don't understand nobody that would have ill will feelings for anybody that's you know getting their just do or, or you know breaking the bank for that matter. I mean, mm -hmm. each his own man. I mean, you should feel happy for someone that that does something great for themselves and their family. You know what I mean? Like, I don't get it. <laughs> and I'll never get it. I don't want to try to get it. You know what I mean? Because I don't, I don't care. I don't, I don't even want that type of thought in my mind to even have any ill feelings about anybody doing anything successful. Not me. And that's what that's why you're a real one. That's why so many, so many players relate to you because again, you you only see the positive in things. And that's 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 a super special quality that you have, you know, from you know, from when you were when you came into the league until you left the league until now. So that's, you know, I think you're magnetic when it comes to all the guys that are that are playing in the league now. They always have something great to say about you because of, you know, you you always have a positive spin on things. Um, talk about your, you know, talk about your, you know, you're wearing a South Carolina Sergi. Um one of our one of our our future stars of our team, Raven Johnson, uh, played in your and your your AI Classic last year, and it was one of the most gratifying experiences for her. Um, and I know I saw the words that you spoke to her um, on social media, and she's always been talking about the experience um, of your your Classic. Why why you decided? Why did you decide to to one have a Classic? you know, four young, young guys, and then start to add females to it. I know Diamond Johnson, who's from Philly, North Philly. Um, you had her, um, a part of your, your, your classic, but it was during the pandemic. So you guys couldn't play the game, but you named her, um, to the team. What, what made, what makes you want to give back, uh, to young people in this way? Cause I can. And why not? <laughs> Why not? I mean, because I can. I, I mean, I thought about the, you know, um, like I said, I wanted to be like Mike. You know what I mean? And and I want to be like him in so many other ways off the basketball court. And I'm, I'm growing so much um, as a as a businessman, as a as a man in general, um, and as a person. You know what I mean? And I I feel like the sky's the limit. You know what I mean? And I I live, you know, by you only live once. You know what I mean? I wanna I wanna make my mark in this world, not only just with basketball. There's so many other things that I can do, um, motivational uh things that I can do. Um and um I just, you know, wanna use the 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 name that I have and the platform to um to help people. And I just I just felt like, you know, I thought about the McDonald classics and uh the what it was the Jordan game and you know, all of that stuff coming up, you know what I mean? I was like, man, I just get my own game, you know what I mean? And I got a bunch of great guys around me to help me put it together. Um, and just having, you know, the first woman was just dope, you know what I mean? The only thing I was nervous about was um, her going out there and the guys not wanting to be shown up. So, you know, with any matchup that she was in, you know what I mean? I knew that whoever was guarding her or whoever was going at her, you know what I mean, was going to take it up another level. But I was just so happy that she held her own the way she did. And I was, I was, it was just, I was so proud, man. And, um, and I just felt like I saw myself in her with the, I can do it attitude, like, and I want to do it. And I'm not afraid of it. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to go at it. And it was just so gratifying to see, you know what I mean? I was just, you know, after the game, I was so proud. I was trying to, you know, hold back and keep it in, you know what I mean, when I was talking to her because I meant every word, you know what I mean? And, and the sky's the limit for her. And that takes that takes some toughness to be able to, you know, to, to step in the fire like that. And, um, you know, it was unfortunate that she got hurt, but I'm, I'm looking forward to 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 rooting her on, you know what I mean. Um, you know that's my that's my mob. You know what I mean. I I, I rock with y'all. Um, it, it it was ugly yesterday, but um, <laughs> it was ugly. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Ugly. Right. <laughs> and, but I, but I, if I could have it my way, I wanted to stay like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just like like I, I rather I rather um, rather than win by one point, I'd rather get blown. You know, I'd rather blow somebody out. Uh-huh. You know, than be nervous or um, if I lose, I'd rather lose um, like they lost, like how I lost to y'all. You know what I mean? Then get beat at the buzzer. That's just uh-huh. me. You know what I mean? Um, looking back on it, um, and even even then with our squad in two thousand and one, people think it's crazy, but I'd rather not have gotten there. You know what I mean? To get that feeling of not being able to win it. You know what I mean? Um, I know it sounds crazy, but um, just to be right there and not be able to f- fulfill your dream. Um, that was that was tough on me. But then the maturation part of my life started to kick in um, with Sonny Hill. used to talk to me about all the time in the locker room. Um, you know, um, look how many things that happened to me in my career. I mean, all I wanted to do was get drafted, a kid from Newport News, Hampton, Virginia. Um, and that was the biggest thing. You know, like people asked me, it was the biggest thing that happened in my career. And that was it, just being drafted. But the icing on the cake was all the other things that came. Look at our cultural icon, MVP, scoring titles, all-star games, all-star MVPs. I mean, just, I mean, known all over the world. I can go any place in the world and step off the plane and they know who I am. And a household name in Philly, a legend. I got the greatest relationship with the Philly fans that no one in the world has. You know what I mean? And um, I didn't win a championship. And I look at it like that. You know what I mean? Okay, that's something that God didn't want for me. You know what I mean? And it's it's easy. It's so much easier to deal with it when you think of all the things that He did want for me. So that's what I you know when I saw in and Raven like you with it, like you with whatever you go whatever you want in this world. I know you willing to go after. It. I'm excited to share more about Flame Bearers, one of my new favorite podcasts on Flame Bearers, top women Olympic and Paralympic athletes from around the world, like USA Soccer's Becky Sauerbrunn and Nigerian hoop star Azene Kalu Phelps share their rarely heard stories and their full selves. Hear directly from the masters of grit and resilient to learn more about the issues that matter most to them and how they've been able to overcome obstacle after obstacle. Season two is live now, and Flame Bearers is spotlighting the women athletes blazing a trail to Beijing, including U.S. figure skater Brady Tennell, ROC's Oksana Abdekarmanmova, and many more. When you watch them compete in February and March, you'll see what they've worked so hard to achieve. But first, hear from them what happens when the cameras are off and stadiums are silent? During these challenging times, these women are an endless source of hope and inspiration. Our next partner has a product I use literally every day. In just a few short weeks of adding Athletic Greens to my daily routine, I was fully bought into the hype. Before Athletic Greens, I felt like I had to take so many different supplements to just get the daily nutrition I needed. It was hard to create and sustain any kind of routine, especially how much I'm on the move. Now, I have my bag at home and take my travel packs on the go. No matter where I am, I shake it up, drink it first thing in the morning, and start my day the right way. Right now, it's time to prioritize your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. I love the peace of mind it gives me. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash net. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash N-E-T to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance.
What's the best workout program? The one that is custom built just for you. Future is the new workout experience that pairs you one-on-one -on -one with your own fitness coach. Your coach will map out a plan based on your goals with workouts delivered to your phone each week. Future, your Apple Watch and the app all pair seamlessly so you and your coach can track your progress, celebrate achievements, and keep you accountable every day. Get started right now with 50% off your first three months at tryfuture.com slash netlife. Have you ever heard of recovery footwear or active recovery? I had neither until a fellow coach gifted me a pair of UFOs. And let me tell you, they have become my habit. I keep a pair everywhere, at home, in my office, in my locker, everywhere. As a former athlete, I still work out. It's tough to turn that off, but I also have to get my boy Champ his exercise. And of course, coaching is super active. So I'm constantly on the move. My UFOs help me feel so much better throughout the day, no matter how much I have going on. UFOs uses a unique foam material called UFOM TM that absorbs impact so your body doesn't have to. You know, the journey that leads you to success is filled with adversity that can knock you off your path. But the resilience to sustain that success starts with active recovery and UFOs. Check out all the different styles, each with the same foam technology and footbed on UFOs.com. They changed my life and I think they could do the same for you. Osa Mimosas are a drink I recently discovered. Their canned mimosas come in four delicious flavors like classic orange, peach bellini, mango, and my personal favorite, cranberry mimosa. They're made with premium sparkling wine, 100% real fruit juice, and contain 80% less sugar and 60% fewer calories than typical mimosas. But the best part is they're always ready to go, which means zero prep and most importantly, zero mess. Right now, Osa is partnering with NetLife to give our listeners a free four-pack of their best-selling classic mimosas with any purchase over $29. Simply add items to your cart and they'll automatically add a free four-pack to your order once your cart reaches $29 or more. Do yourself a favor and grab some delicious mimosas at osamimosas.com slash JWS. That's O H. Z A mimosas.com slash J W S. You know, you, you didn't get the championship, but you championed so many people, like so many generations. So I know sometimes, uh, sometimes you, 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 you your fulfillment is getting that, that hardware, that ring, right. but trust me, Trust me, you you put so many rings on on our fingers as as fans, as people who, you know, who were down with you for all of it. Like we never we we never turn our backs on you, never, because you never turn your back on us, and you'll forever be that. And Raven's the same way. Raven is is loyal. Raven is working hard. Raven's gonna be a star. Like we miss her. We miss we we miss her presence because she's a killer. Like she's a killer on both sides of the basketball. So I'm glad she got a chance to just, just touch, you know, the hem of your garment, because I know those experiences will propel her to being great. Like next year, this time of the year, she's going to be talked about and talked about in a big way because she's going to, she's going to lead us. The only thing she wants to do like you is, is win a, is win a national championship. I, I'm going to tell a story. Like I, I had a couple of, of our players yesterday in our practice before we practice actually the day before. And I said, I, I bought four of them up. One of them was Raven. So I said, Raven, so act like you're the coach of this team. I want you to coach those people who, who um, feel like, feel like, well, they got one step in and one step out. Mm -hmm. And she was like, there's no room for it. She was like, we got one goal, and that's to win a national championship. So if you can't get down with that, then, then you don't need to be in the room. 
And that and that's Raven. She ain't playing a lit. She ain't playing a minute since the first the, the second game of the season. But she still feels like she's she's a part of it. And I know I put her in those situations because I know she's going to lead our team one day and she's got to get used to standing up and, and talking about some things that people don't want to talk about. So thanks for you for giving her, you know, that courage um, to go out there and be the be the only girl out there on the floor and giving her some encouraging words. Cause I know we'll, it will be long lasting. We're going, we're going, we're going, we're going to follow up. I just got a couple of more questions. Um, one of the best things about growing up is being able to self reflect and look mm-hmm. at how you've changed and, and grew as a person. Mm-hmm. When you look at your, at your 20 year old self, what was the biggest difference between him and you today? Oh man, we don't got enough time. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have enough time. It's so many. It's so I've grown in every aspect of my life. I've I've grown um, every aspect, especially um, as a basketball mind. And my mind is so different. I see things so different, um, especially with everything that Larry Brown taught me. Um, I was I was I was a great player coming into the league at 20, 21 years old. I was I was a I was a talent. I was a talent. Um and I was able to compete on on every night. I was I was I could hold my own. But once I felt once I took Coach Brown's constructive criticism the right way, I always thought he was just being on me, you know, but he wanted the same thing that I wanted. We we wanted the same goal, you know what I mean. He wanted me to be the best player in the league, and he wanted us to be the best team in the league. And once I started um, receiving constructive criticism, like I should have been, um, that's the only regret I have in my whole career is you know not taking in everything that he was dishing out the right way. Because once I did, it took me from just a you know. Uh, all-star player to the best player in the league to the MVP, well, the best player in the world, and um, that's something that's that's totally different. Um, I don't know. I, I think um, being able to um, being able to say no. Um, I I don't I don't think the word exists. I don't think I had it in my vocabulary, um, and it still don't exist with um, my daughters. Like that's the only that's the only they my kryptonite, you know what I mean? Um but yeah, just um learning how to say no, you know, um for me, the for the betterment of for me and the person that you're saying no to, you know what I mean? Because you're not, you know, I'm in this world to help people, you know what I mean? And saying yes to somebody all the time is not helping them. You know what I mean? All you're doing is, you know, being their crutch and crippling them. You know what I mean? Um, um, but every other aspect in my life, like anything that you could think of, I would like to think that um, from 20 to, t- to 46, um, that every aspect of my life has, um, has, has gotten better or some elevation or some, um, maturation to it you know what I mean um and especially especially basketball I mean obviously um you probably couldn't see a, a hall of fame basketball player then at first you might have seen a special talent but then you know I I felt my game getting better and better because I was getting better up here like I remember my my first game I played against um Kevin Johnson the first time I played against him and he had 36 six and six and I never got killed like that before. And I was in the locker room and I was crying. And Maurice Cheeks came up to me and he was like, don't worry about a young fella. You know, one day you're going to get somebody 36, 9, and 9. And Kevin Johnson, I had everything that he had, speed and everything. But he was just so much further ahead of me, you know, mentally. He was backdooring me. He was, I mean, doing all, I mean, just picking me apart. And, um... I had to learn um, with all the athletic ability 
to have that John Stockton mind, to have that Steve Nash mind, you know what I mean? Um, to, to, to have the Magic Johnson mind, you know, just think the game out. Just know, you know, you don't have to play zoom, 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 zoom all the time. Sometimes you can just, you know, outthink them. Like, and then when younger guys came in, when I was 25, 26, 30 years old, I wouldn't have to go fast all the time. You know, I could outthink them. So I know I got long winded on that, but Don, every, every part of my life, every part of my basketball career, every part of my life, um, everything on and off the court. Um, I, I would like to think that I elevated. I think so too. I, I, I know I set you up for that, for that question. You know, I, I, I just think that, um, you, you, you've done things your way. Um, and yeah, your way unapologetically, which, which I, which I love. I, and I, and you're, you know, you reflected on um, just giving yourself to to Coach Brown, and what you did, you saw you saw your basketball career move. Um, and I think it takes it takes time and experience for you to really understand because when you when you're killing folks, you know, like you were, you thinking this is you know what what more can I do? You know how mm-hmm. much better can I get? And yet, you know, he's been around a long time. He's still coaching. Is he still coaching with uh, Memphis? If he's, is he still with yeah. Memphis? Yeah. You know, like once a coach, always a coach. Um, and he's still parting knowledge to, you know, Penny and probably the players of like, like, like this generation. Like, it, it, I mean, because Larry Brown is such a great coach, he's, he's still relatable, like yeah. because of his basketball mind. So that's, that's hey, super cool. Great. He say, um, he, he say the biggest kick he get out of everything is still today. Whenever somebody see him, they always say, oh, um, I know you. You're Allen Iverson's coach. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He, st- he say they still say that to him um, today. And that's, and that's crazy. And, and he wanted me to be the best, you know, teammate. Like one of my proudest moments was being a captain because it was always Eric and E. And um, I think out of my whole career, the thing that I'm the most proud of with, with all the, the, the um, what do you call it, the super teams that yep. they talk about with guys getting on certain teams and, you know what I mean, and putting teams together and all that, which, which I don't have a problem with to each his own. Everything's changing. <laughs> it might even get worse than this. But um, I think the biggest – compliment and the, the thing that I love the most um, is when you have Allen Iverson on a team, regardless of who the other guys on the floor with him, those guys in the foxhole with him always feel like they got a chance to win as long as he's on the team with them. And that's the dopest feeling in the world. You know what I mean? Because you know, you got somebody that was six feet, 165, soaking wet. And with all these guys that's, you know, they had all stars, multiple all stars on different teams. And my guys felt like we can knock them off. And the crazy thing about it is I always looked at it like, well, shit, I'm on a squad with four other pros. You know what I mean? Like, how can you beat me? I'm on a team with, it's me and I'm playing with, four other pros. I ain't looking at the name on the back of their jerseys, whatever. I know that they pros and I know what they can do because I watch them at practice all the time. You know what I mean? So that's the biggest compliment for me as a player. And that's, you know, the thing that I take with me from my career to my grave that I always be proud of that feeling. You know, when I'm in the foxhole with guys, they know we got a chance to win. I I, I know I'm, you know, I'm I'm really gushing over you because you know that's what you were to all of us. Seriously, like we felt like because be, because you felt that way, like we can't lose, and you you gave that. I mean, it, it wasn't even in a basketball sense; it was in a life sense because right. because how you played the game is is how most of us had to play this 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 game of life, and you always gave us you know, a, 
an opportunity to win. Like we felt like we can win just because, you, you know, you won and the way you approach things. So I, so we appreciate that. We're going to finish up with this, though. We, we, we got a, a little game. It's called a net life shot clock. So if you can answer as many questions as possible under 20 seconds, but don't worry about the 20 seconds because it's you. <laughs> I can so ask, I'm asking questions? No, no, you're answering. answering. All right, cool. So I'm going to ask you the question. Here it is. What's your favorite place to eat in Philly? Um, Larry's Cheesesteak. No, okay. no, no, no. Donato's, Donato's, Donato's Crabs. The Crabs? It's not there no more. It's not there no more, but Donato's, yeah. You know what? Somebody asked me about, somebody asked me what restaurant I, I they always ask me, where, where, where should I, you know, where should they eat? And I actually recently said Donato's, and I didn't even know if it was still there. So it's not there anymore? Yeah, it's not there no more. And I'm trying, I'm reaching out to some, I'm trying my hardest to, um, that's something that I need to get to on on because I would love to find out how or what we can do to, um, like, if I can partner with them, if they still, whatever I have to do, you know what I mean, to, you Let's to go, say Leonardo's. Let's go. Yeah, yes, go I do. Oh yeah, I would. I would love to get it open back up or something. <laughs> I, I ate it um, at least four times out of a week, at least. <laughs> they had my card on file. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm sorry about that, but, but yeah, Leonardo's. But uh -huh. no, shout out to Larry's. Uh, Larry's. Larry's. Um, cheese cheese steaks. steaks. Yo, but I send them yeah. there too. I send them there too. I got my hair done right next door, so I used to always <laughs> get there after shoot around, get my hair done. Then give me a cheese steak, go home, eat, go to sleep, and then back to the game. Time. <laughs> okay. If you can make one rule, everyone has to follow, what would it be? Um, no more racism. See, that's powerful. That's powerful. It's powerful. I ask a lot of people that that question, and then no one's come up with something so so profound. That's that's pretty good. Who, who has the best crossover in the game today? Kyrie. Oh, Kyrie special now. Yes. <laughs> Ky Ky Kyrie. Kyrie is on a, on another level. Yeah, he got the most, the best, damn near everything. <laughs> everything in his bag. Every single thing. I, I would say, uh, where do you keep the, you know, your MVP trophy, but I, I see it in the background. That's it, right? Oh, yeah, I got it. I got some, I got some hardware back there. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favorite women's player? Women's player. Raven. Okay, Raven. Okay, sure. Raven. Um, what was your favorite city to play in? Um, I wanna say Milwaukee. Milwaukee. Really? Why? I don't know. For some reason, I like them, them rims. And I like the, oh. the, the, the lighting in, in their old gym and all that. Like, I used to, woo. <laughs> I, think I, put up, I think I put up the most 50-point uh, games in my career. I, well, I don't know. I, I, I might have the highest average um, in there more than any other, other gym. But, yeah, I, I mean, any gym, any gym where the fans gave me um, – a hard time too, like you know, Indiana, um, Indiana, Boston, Utah. You know what I mean? Places where they where they gave me a hard time. This this isn't one of this isn't one of my my questions. I just added this one. Um, this isn't one of the questions on my paper. Who had the best clubs? What city had the best clubs? Um, Atlanta. Atlanta? Okay, all right. <laughs> Atlanta, Atlanta or Miami? Yeah. I, got, I got a couple more questions. Like, how much money do you think you, like you, I'm not going to say wasted, but just wasted having fun. Like, you just splurged. I don't think it was wasted, because I had fun. You know right. what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you get some money right. back. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, if you could have you one. Be somebody like me, though. Uh, you got to be somebody like you, know, you though, right? You got to know who you are. Yes. <laughs> know who you are. Know if it's going to keep coming. Mm -hmm. um, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? One superpower? Um, 
Um, one superpower. Wow. If I could have one superpower, it would be, I think, for, um, for us to stop killing each other. If I could do that, that would be dope. To stop us hurting each other. Sorry, powerful, powerful. Um, on this podcast, I'm talking leadership, disruptors, change makers. It's hoops, it's politics, it's pop culture. It's the net sum of life. So before I let you go, AI, I ask all my guests for some words of wisdom that they either receive, that helps guide them, or that they want to pass along to others. What words of wisdom do you have to share? My words of wisdom is um, whatever you want to do in life and you put your heart into it, put your mind into it, you put the effort into it, it can be accomplished. Um, if you don't think you can do it, then why should anybody else feel you can? Um, if you don't believe in yourself, um, then obviously you don't believe in God or your God, whatever God that is that, that you love and that you call on for anything. Um, because obviously you don't believe in him because I'm pretty sure that it's embedded in your mind already. You know what I mean? That, that you can do whatever you want to do because the thought is there, you know, if you, if you come up with the thought, then obviously, you know, it, it's something that can be done if, if you thought about it, you know what I mean? And I feel like anybody can do anything that they put their mind to because I'm, I'm living proof. I'm living proof. I have so many much more goals that I want to do. So many more things that I want to do in life. And, and basketball was one of them. I just want to accomplish so many more things in life. And I believe because I already know. Um, it's like I tell my kids um, um, all the time. And I tell the kids from all over the world. You know what I mean? I'm living proof. I want it to be who I am. I want to be a household name. I wanted to be a basketball player and it happened. So you can't tell me that dreams don't come true. So that's, you know, that's the jewel that I give anybody. I don't give a damn what age you are. You know what I mean? If it, if it happened, haven't happened yet, then um, now we're going to be realistic about it. If you're trying to be a basketball player and you're 60 years old, Damn, <laughs> it ain't gonna happen. If you be thinking about uh, doing something else, or if you're still in the basketball, whatever somebody sixty years old can do in, with it, with basketball, you need to get into that coaching or something like that. But you can do Larry, anything. Larry, Larry Brown is still doing it, so you got a shot at, at still coaching. So that's definitely got that's pretty that good. It. <laughs> it helps to have, have a resume like him because it's it's hard for too many people to turn the basketball mind down. Um, hey, I, I, I really appreciate you coming on and spending spending some time with me. Um, do you have anything you want to plug or promote? No. Um, um, no, I'm good. All right. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Do, do you still draw? I just want to say, um, I just want to um, just say, you know, uh, I never got a chance to talk about coach, but, you know, rest in peace, coach. I love you. I miss you. And um, I'm try to continue to make you proud. Coach Thompson. Coach Thompson. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, AI. Yeah. Um, do, do you still draw? Do I? You do? I, 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 I mess around, but what's crazy is it rubbed off on one of my daughters. That's good. That's good. That's good. My sister, yo, and she got it. She, I mean, oh my God. I mean, you, I think she, you think she's gonna go to school for it or anything? She can do whatever she wanna do with it. I'm telling her to, I've been telling her to put together her little portfolio, but she's like insane with it. She's insane with it. But then she's real pretty too. So she in the, the modeling and all that <laughs> stuff. So 
you know. So, but I mean, it's it's great having different talents. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Can't go wrong with 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 you know widening your horizon and wanting to do multiple things. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. if God gave you the talent, you use it. You know, ain't nothing in this world waste uh, worse than wasted talent. Yep. But that girl can draw. She put me to shame. <laughs> so. Well I, well, I appreciate it. Appreciate y'all. Y'all, y'all were the first family in, in, in Philadelphia. So Tawana, whole family, appreciate y'all for sharing, you know, all of you with us in Philly. Thank you so much, Don. I appreciate right. it. Good luck. I love Thank you. you. Thank you. Love you too. I ain't nervous no more. Nah. <laughs> I, I, I shook it all off. I'm good. <laughs> So next time I see you, it's just going to be all love. Right? Oh. You got to worry about me acting like a 46-year-old shy man. <laughs> all yeah. love. Gary, thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you all so much for listening. Don't forget to follow NetLife with Dawn Staley on Apple Podcasts. Uh, subscribe on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. NetLife is produced by Just Women Sports. For more great sports content, go to JustWomenSports.com. Be sure to subscribe to the newsletter and YouTube channel and follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And this is Dawn Staley signing off. Before you see their scores, hear their stories. On the Flame Bearers podcast, top women identifying athletes from around the world share their trials triumphs, and full selves. With the Beijing Winter Paralympics underway, Flame Bearers' second season is live now and highlighting stories from U.S. figure skater Brady Tennell, ROC's Oksana Abdekarmanmova, and many more. Get ready for the Beijing Games and listen to Flame Bearers wherever you get your podcasts.